Bertain Nexus Conference on Water, Food, Energy, and Climate. He was executive director of the Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future from 1992 to 2012. That's based in London, and it's the primary organization that coordinates all the NGO activity in relation to the UN Sustainable Development Program. He played a significant role in promoting multi-stakeholder dialogues at the United Nations and proposed to the UN General Assembly the introduction of a stakeholder dialogue session at the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development. He's been active at the United Nations since 1990, attending and actively participating in the World Summits. The first one at Rio in 1992, Habitat 2, Rio plus 5, Beijing plus 5, Copenhagen plus 5, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2000, Rio plus 20. In 2011, he chaired the United Nations uh, Department of Public Information, 64th Non-Governmental Organization Conference, Sustainable Societies and Responsive Citizens. From 1997 to 2001, he co-chaired the UN Commission on Sustainable Development NGO Steering Committee. He has coordinated some of the most innovative stakeholder dialogues at the intergovernmental level, bond water, bond energy, and bond nexus. He has a position with the UN Global Studies Program. He has a position with the Ford Foundation advising them on sustainable development. He currently advises more than one government on sustainable development projects. He has written or edited 13 books, including From Rio to a New Development Agenda, Building a Bridge to Sustainable Future, which was written on, uh, which is, um, is that the, that's the most recent one? No. No. Okay. Um, that's right. That's the one that was, that's already been written. Um, for Rio Plus 20, he produced Only One Earth, which I have a copy of. Uh, the Long Road via Rio to Sustainable Development with Michael Strauss and Marie Strong. In May 2016, he co-edited co with Jamie Bartram at UNC, will be published, called The Water, Food, and Climate Nexus, Challenges and Agenda for Action. And he's currently working on a book um, describing the journey from Rio Plus 20 to the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted last September. So he's an uh, uh, amazing man, one of the most influential, well, probably the most influential non-governmental organization representative at the UN. He knows most of the UN representatives from around the world, and, and they know him. And he really knows everyone in the NGO, in the uh, community that is involved at the global level in sustainable development projects. When we schedule this program, <coughs> there's a question about, okay, why global citizenship? What can we do at the global level? Is this really relevant to our church? I've been uh, reading a book. It's called, Does Altruism Exist? It's, a, it's by a biologist, and he's reporting on, on a revolution in evolutionary biology. From Darwin's time onward until very recently, the concentration was on the survival of the fittest at the individual level. In the last few years, more and more uh, research has been done on the survival of groups. And in the survival of groups, collective action is more important than individual fitness. In other words, if everyone in the group is just striving for their own good, the group won't survive. So by groups, he means everything from multicellular organisms, which are groups of groups of groups, to in the human society, the human society is one superorganism that's evolving through cultural evolution. And he says at the end of his book, he says, now we are at a point in history where the great problem of human life is to establish functional organization at a larger scale than ever. And he talks about multi-level uh, selection theory. It makes it crystal clear that if we want the world to become a better place, 
we must, must choose policies with the welfare of the whole world in mind. As far as our selection criteria are concerned, we must become planetary altruists. And he defines altruism as functional group action, whether it in, is, comes out of selfish motives or, or, um, or high motives. It's just functional group action. So uh, he also talks about, um, at the individual level, that we that there's a kind of hidden hand, but only if you're aware of the global context. So if you're aware of the global context, then you can make your own action at the regional and local level effective. And that's why I feel it's so important to hear his message this morning. Thank you very much, uh, and um, the book on the right-hand side will be out on the 24th of April, and the forward is by Prince Charles, who's taken a great interest in the interlinkage between issues such as food, water, energy, and climate change. Um, could you put the next slide up? Sure. What I was asked to talk about, to some extent, is this global citizens movement that has started to evolve um, over the last 40 years, and perhaps taking us back a little bit to 1968 and uh, Apollo 8, where we, to some extent, got that first vision of the planet um, from the moon. It made us feel a little bit more connected, and to some extent saw the birth of the environment movement. We had Rachel Carson's Silent Spring published earlier in the 60s. And, next slide. Um, and then um, in 1970, we had the first Earth Day um, in the preparation, to some extent, for the upcoming first UN conference on environment, which was to be held in 1972. That period from 1970 to 1972 was quite a critical one. You see two of the major non-profit uh, organizations, non-government organizations created, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. Uh, you also saw President Nixon create the Environment Protection Agency and to some extent also help the setting up of the United Nations um, UNFPA um, through the Rockefeller Commission that had made that recommendation. Um, we also saw in 72 Maurice Strong who um, wrote the book with me, um, Only One Earth, which um, we published just before the Rio Plus 20 conference. Um, he was the first Secretary General of a UN conference on environment, so he uh, as a very young 34-year-old Canadian chair uh, that particular conference. And it had a significant impact in starting to look at the dialogue between development and environment. That in fact, the choices that we make, um, both in industrialized countries and developing countries, have a significant impact on the planet, this fragile earth that we live in, live on. And, um, at that particular conference, Indira Gandhi was the only head of state from a developing country that attended, but she put poverty as one of the critical issues that needed to be addressed within a, a discourse on environment, and I think that was really important. Out of the 1972 conference, they set up the first UN body on the environment, the United Nations Environment Program, and it had two particular objectives. One was to be a global voice for the environment, uh, to bring countries together and non-state actors so that they might address the challenges as we move forward. And the second was to be a, a home for science, to be an early warning system uh, where things were going wrong, to be a place where the scientists could say, policymakers, you need to make a decision on this. So those two really fundamental um, areas have been at the real center of the United Nations Environment Program. And around the creation of UNEP, the non-state actors played a critical role in the establishment of that organization, but also in the context of supporting the development of science in, uh, the, in the coming years. In 1973, the 
The European Union, to some extent, followed suit, uh, followed the United States, which had been the first uh, country to set up an environmental protection agency by setting up uh, the European wing that um, uh, looked at environment. And one of the reasons, as some of you will remember, that the EPA was set up was to deal with issues of clean water and clean air. And those applied wherever you were in the world. And so the need to address those was really critical. Next slide. Um, as we went through the 70s, um, things on the environment were very difficult. We'd had the Yom Kippur War in 19, I think, 71. There'd been a hike in oil prices, sounds a bit similar to more recent times. Um, and that had focused very much um, governments on other issues than uh, addressing environment. Though under Jimmy Carter, there was a big push for energy efficiency. By the time we got to the 80s, um, we found a serious issue that needed to be dealt with on environment. Joe Farmer of the British Antarctic Survey found a hole over uh, the Antarctic. Um, NASA confirmed that hole and within a year countries met in Vienna and agreed a framework convention to deal with ozone depleting chemicals, the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons. That uh, commitment didn't have any reductions in CFCs, it was what was to, uh, in a sense, give the framework for governments to address it. They met again two years later in Montreal and agreed a 50% reduction in CFCs and by 1989 uh, that Montreal Protocol had come into effect in 1990. There was a London conference which um, went as far as committing to a 100% reduction in CFCs. But the hole that they viewed in 1980 would only have, uh, to some extent, be recreated at that level uh, by 2050. Uh, so it takes a long while for the Earth to, uh, to um, heal itself. Next slide. But that played a very important role in showing that intergovernmental processes uh, play a critical role in the context of addressing inter state uh, issues, inter-country issues. If we're going to address issues like the ozone layer, like um, issues on climate change and biodiversity, then that needs to be done in a cooperative way among um, member states of the UN. I'm going to take us through a little bit of the conversation that's gone on since 1992. Um, to, uh, take us through to uh, the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, the World Summit on Sustainable Development, and then the conferences that happened after that, to the point where last year most people would say it was the most important year for multilateralism, or for multilateralism in the area of sustainable development that we'd had since 1992. Next slide. Maurice Strong, uh, as the father of sustainable development, also was the Secretary General of the 1992 conference. He actually died uh, in November, just before the Paris Agreement. And you have to remember that that Earth Summit in 1992 set in motion the process that we call the Climate Change Convention. Uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was the last international environmental agreement that the US Senate has ratified. It ratified it in, I think, 1994. Um, it also agreed a convention on biological diversity. It attempted to have a convention on forests. The United States had played a critical role in trying to get that convention um, on the books. Um, it also agreed uh, a set of principles, the Rio uh, principles, one of which is the polluter pays principle, which you've seen very much in action with the, ac the activities of BP and the oil spill. Uh, that it had. But that also applies to climate change. If we produce all this CO2 and then other countries find that they are impacted by the, um, the uh, changes in weather, then clearly we have a responsibility in the developed countries to pay for the uh, reparations that need to be made. One of the other most significant aspects of the Rio conference in 1992 was it's the first conference that uh, the UN recognized the role of different stakeholders. In fact, this agreement, Agenda 21, which was 40 chapters dealing with 
poverty, dealing with population, dealing with human settlements, with biodiversity, with a multitude of environmental challenges that were in front of uh, the world and development challenges as well. Um, also had nine chapters saying if we're going to address these problems, governments by themselves cannot do it. They need to work with other stakeholders in society and it recognized nine of them and particularly in the follow-up to the 1992 conference, it asked in chapter 28 of Agenda 21 dealing with local authorities, it asked local authorities to consult with their populations to see if they could come up with their own version of Agenda 21. So it wasn't that Agenda 21 was going to be imposed on a community, it was each community around the world decided what they wanted to have uh, to address their sustainable future. And over 6,000 local authorities did that around the world and I think had a real big impact in the context of um, local sustainability movements. It also challenged businesses to change their, their patterns of production. It also challenged trade unions to work with um, um, business and NGOs on a just transition as old jobs in old um, more polluting industries um, phase out, then there needs to be a transition to help uh, retool uh, the workers to be able to work in the new technologies. Next slide. As we move forward into the five-year review of uh, Agenda 21, one of the very important aspects of that wasn't just were we on the right track to address the challenges that had been raised in 92 and to some extent we weren't and we weren't because um, there had been a commitment in uh, Rio in 1992 to transfer 125 billion dollars from developed countries to developing countries. In 1992 it was about 60 billion. In fact by 1997 it hadn't gone up, it had fallen to 55. So instead of helping developing countries like China and India choose a more sustainable path, the money that had been seen as the peace dividend actually went to help stabilize Eastern Europe after the war came down. And so a huge opportunity to move us into a more sustainable uh, journey had not been taken. But one of the things that was good is that they recognized that not only should stakeholders be engaged in helping to deliver the uh, global agreements. But in the five years since the Rio conference, they recognized that stakeholders should be involved in helping governments make better informed decisions. But if they can hear non-government organizations or community-based organizations about the impact of the policies, then the policies would change to be more likely to move us in the right direction. And so the decision was taken at the five-year review that in the two weeks, the ten days of negotiations that governments had at the Commission on Sustainable Development every year, that two of those days would be assigned to a dialogue, 12 hours to a dialogue with stakeholders to see whether the impact that was expected at the um, the local and the national level, that those stakeholders felt that those policies were actually working. And if they weren't, what needed to happen to change that? And that was, I think, a really uh, significant, um, significant movement. To some extent, we're moving from Madison democracy, representative democracy, to Jefferson democracy, participatory democracy. And we're in this period at the moment where uh, we're in what I call stakeholder democracy where having uh, big groups of society that are involved in the delivery of um, the agreements uh, should be at the table. And to help us, I started to try and put together some definitions of the players because there have been different discourses going on in the last 20 years, all of which to some extent have been supportive of each, of each other but have come from different places. The Rio process birth this stakeholder approach, uh, that those impacted by a decision or those who impact on a decision should have a seat at the table. But you've also seen the growth of the social movements and many social summits that happened, uh, particularly since 2000. Um, you saw that reflected to some extent in 
the opposition to the World Trade Organization in Seattle, um, I think in 2000, when there were huge demonstrations about the way that trade was going to impact on the poorest. You've also seen a discourse on civil society, which tends to aggregate uh, those stakeholders uh, into one voice. Sometimes that's a good thing to do. Sometimes it's better to hear uh, a women's voice or a youth voice as an individual voice and not try and aggregate it together. All of these support the growth, I think, of a global citizenship because all of these different movements, these approaches, are about recognizing that it's not just um, us working for our own country or just our own community, but that we're all working to try and make it possible to live more sustainably on this planet. So they all are part of the development of a global citizens movement. In the 1990s, to help develop that, there were a number of UN summits, and around those summits, it gave the opportunity for lots of different people to come together and to start to have a discussion on what they thought uh, we should be doing at the global level, but also what networks could be created to help deliver those at the national and local level. And as you can see, those action plans cover pretty much all the areas that you would imagine. Um, next slide. Um, what we saw in 2000 was a recognition by governments, not by stakeholders, that there were, those agendas were too large. Governments were finding it very difficult to deliver those agendas, and so focused down on eight, um, eight specific goals, most of them dealing with the symptoms and not the root causes, which was really part of the problem. The global citizen movement as such did not play a significant role in the development of those eight, and it took a, a few years before people focused on trying to deliver them, because it's not that these aren't important, it's just that it would have had a much better impact at delivering if um, those stakeholders had been involved in the decision-making process. Those eight goals were meant to be supplemented in 2002 by additional goals, particularly in the area of environment, and additional targets. And unfortunately, as we all know, the impact of 9-11 cascaded through society in many different ways. And one of the ways it cascaded through the work that I did is that virtually all of the preparatory work to add to those eight goals were not able to come to fruition. The focus in, uh, in uh, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg ended up with just not an additional goal or two, but just one additional target on sanitation. So the hopes to have a more encompassing agenda in 2002 didn't come to, uh, into, in, uh, into effect. At the same time, the TELUS Institute, which I'm an associate fellow of, and uh, Paul Raskin, who uh, heads that, looked at a number of scenarios for the world. Uh, in 2002. And they came up with three different scenarios, a conventional world, a world of barbarism, and a world of great transitions. And in those scenarios, they looked at two different particular scenarios. Um, we have, at least in the 1990s and the first part of the 2000s, very much been looking at a, a market force driven uh, agenda. Um, I sit myself in the, in the policy reform agenda. I spend most of my time trying to persuade governments to take the right decisions when they come to these intergovernmental negotiations and it takes a long while to move that. But um, the, my viewpoint was that you can actually reform the process from within. If we aren't able to do that then there will be many walls built, not just one between Mexico and the United States but between Europe and Africa and whatever. And if we end up in a fortress world then those fortresses will be about just protecting the people in those uh, walls and the global nature of our world will disappear. Uh, we could also see breakdown um, if we imagine uh, that we're going down that path and there are elements of that you can see around the world. It's not just in, um, in the United States where some of this has been reflected. I come from the United Kingdom and parts of the United Kingdom, oh, parts of the political arena in the UK want to exit from the European Union. 
and build a kind of small Britain that I'm not sure Scotland will stay with them if they try to do that. Um, but that's another example of uh, the world that we're challenged to uh, operate in. And then the great transition, how can we, maybe through a global citizens movement, uh, be able to really start to, to link together as citizens around the world and as communities and as um, towns and as organizations to try and address the challenges that are in front of us. Uh, next slide. Um, as we moved forward um, in um, the 2000s, uh, President Mbeki, who is uh, at the top, was um, actually in 2002 had chaired the Johannesburg Summit. He declared in 2006 that sustainable development was dead. And in 2007, the uh, Commission on Sustainable Development were unable to agree any policy on energy and climate change. And so, to some extent, at the global level, the conversation on, on sustainable development was really challenged. In 2007, President Lula of Brazil said this isn't acceptable. What we need to do is come back together as a world community and to have another narrative on how we're going to challenge, address the challenges that are in front of us. This happened at the same time as the financial crisis. So um, the small seeds that were being planted in 2007 by Brazil and by other countries um, were challenged by an, uh, an economic downturn that we have not seen. Um, around the same time, in the run-up to Rio Plus 20, um, Joachim Rockström from the Stockholm Environment Institute and 26 other major scientists started to put numbers on the planetary boundaries. And they identified three that we are, or three or four that we are in danger of either exceeding, we are exceeding, or that um, we're likely to uh, exceed. And these are really important because they interlink with each other. And once you've gone past certain points, there is no return. And so for climate change, we don't know what that is. It might be when the Gulf Stream turns off and things really start to get very dicey. But this definitely is just an environmental perspective. And so Oxfam produced what's known as the Oxfam Donut. So that if there are planetary boundaries that we have, then what we need to do is look at what is the social foundation that we should um, all embrace for us to live on, a, on this planet in a just uh, and safe way. And they look to issues such as water, as food, as jobs, as energy, as having a voice, that these were fundamental issues that we needed to have built into any model on how we might address the uh, planetary boundaries. So, um, in the run-up to Rio Plus 20, uh, the governments of Colombia, uh, Guatemala, Peru, and United Arab Emirates came up with an idea called the Sustainable Development Goals. They proposed it in July 2011. Um, I chaired, as, um, uh, as Herman indicated, the UN conference in, um, it's actually in September 2011, and we came up with the first idea of what those 17 goals should be. Um, but they managed through the process of the run-up to Rio plus 20 to start to, ex to, to recognize that we are all connected. So any goals and targets that are agreed have to apply to all countries, not just to developing countries. To some extent, the Agenda 21 agreed in 1992 was a, a recipe for developing countries. It was to learn from the experience of America and of Europe and, the ex and how could that help developing countries move more sustainably. But now we were all starting to see some of the impacts of that planetary boundaries. But you know, the, the, the fall of sustainable development had been so large. And though the economic crisis had some really interesting um, repercussions such that, uh, for example, Korea, 80% of their, of their uh, recovery package went to green industries. 34% um, of the Chinese recovery package went to, uh, to green industries. 20% of the US went to green industries. I think 29% of Norway. I think the UK was 7%. We were pathetic. So there was the big investment that happened uh, during the financial crisis, which also had a, 
I think, a real important impact. But there was a recognition around Rio Plus 20 that the international agencies that deal with monitoring and uh, reviewing the development towards these, uh, these new goals that would be agreed were not strong enough. And so they, uh, they uh, at Rio Plus 20, strengthened the United Nations Environment Program. It was um, a governing body of 66 countries elected by the 193. It became a universal body, that all countries should be at the table if we're addressing the serious challenges that we are facing. That we needed to uh, replace the Commission on Sustainable Development by a higher level body. And that higher level body, the high level uh, political forum, would meet at every four years at heads of state level. That we couldn't leave it for 20 years for heads of state, or even 10, for them to come and see if they were moving on the right direction. That these challenges were huge. And if you remember the, the book, the Nexus book that I, uh, I've done, the challenges there that in the next um, 15 years we'll have an extra billion people on the planet. The, we'll have uh, urbanization going to 60 to 65 percent and we have an economic uh, approach by developing countries which is too much replicating the approach that we have. The estimations is that we will have a shortfall of food of something like 30 to 40 percent, that there will be a shortfall of energy of the same, but more importantly, and this applies to the United States very much, there will be a shortfall in water availability that that is going to be a critical issue. It will be the new issue that people have to address. It will be equivalent to oil for the future. And it was the number one issue on risk that the World Economic Forum uh, put forward this year uh, and the co companies are starting to address. The other outcomes from the Rio Plus 20 conference was to set up a process on sustainable development goals. And I'll come to that in a second. But also to set up a process where there might be an agreement to finance those goals, which is also critical. And that the technology transfer discussion that had gone nowhere in the previous 20 years, that a new mechanism would be set up to help those developing countries to move faster towards those new technologies and not make the same mistake that we did by going through a polluting approach. So that was very, very important. The TELUS Institute um, launched in 2012 the widening circle to try and link together many of those stakeholder groups working on different things um, into a much more planetary challenge uh, as a first step to try and uh, to some extent move closer to a Jefferson democracy model, one of participatory democracy. And at the moment we still have a very fragmented at least non-government sector, but also women's group sector and youth sector. So the need to try and link those campaigns that are being run by those um, different sectors of society together is quite critical. And that we need to move towards a more global citizen activist approach at the global level. Next one. I'm nearly finished. Um, 